Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnivale, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer Software Tool, also known as Mr. Valuation. And valuation is obviously a very important part of my work. And I've recently been asked several times by different subscribers to both FastGraphs as well as to this YouTube channel, which I really appreciate all of you on the YouTube channel, by the way. And therefore, if you haven't already done it, please uh, subscribe to the channel. And if you end up liking this video, give me a thumbs up and a like and ring the bell and do all that good stuff. But what I've got is an interesting video today. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit, well, it's not totally different, but I've been asked to give a list of the what I consider to be the 10 best, is how it was asked, or the 10, excuse me, the 10 most undervalued dividend aristocrats. And you know, I'm always reluctant to provide lists like that because the market is so dynamic and things change so quickly that if someone gets a list like that, if they're not, you know, prepared to keep up with that list and make sure that they, you know, edit the list over time where they take come stocks off or add them to the list, you know, they can end up making mistakes. So I'm always reticent to do that, which brings up another conundrum. There's also a difference between the cheapest stocks versus the best stocks. Now, the dividend aristocrats, the Standard & Poor's dividend aristocrats are what I'm focusing on with this video. Okay, I'm going to look at, first of all, what I consider to be the 10 most undervalued dividend aristocrats, the ones that are attractive now that can be purchased. But I'm also going to tell you in advance, they're not necessarily my favorite dividend aristocrats. So as a result, I'm going to also show you what I consider to be the best dividend aristocrats that I can invest in if if and only if I could get them in attractive valuations. And that's been virtually impossible, probably going back all the way to 2009 and even 10 and 11, where, you know, coming out of the Great Recession, stocks got cheap, and then we've been on this massive run. So let me go ahead and cover these for you, and, and I'm going to illustrate with two portfolio reviews that I've put together. All right, the first one I got here is the aristocrats. I'm calling it the top 10. These are the 10 cheapest. What I want you to notice is that, you know, for valuation, especially with companies, aristocrats aren't going to be the fastest growing stocks in the world. You're looking at companies here, they're going to grow at, you know, 6, 8, 10% a year, maybe even up to 12 or 14% in some cases. But they're not the fastest growing stocks in the world. But they are companies that have increased their dividend for at least 25 consecutive years. Okay, and they come also in different quality characteristics. Here you've got them, you know, ranging in credit ratings from A all the way down to triple B. They're all investment grade, I might add. And there's only 10 stocks in this list. If you look at earnings yield, I'm looking for an earnings yield of at least 7.5% or higher. Now, a couple of them are close, like Archer Daniel Midlands at 7.35. I'd actually like about, you know, 7.6 or 7 or better. But these are close, especially in today's overheated market. I also are looking for companies that have good dividend growth records. And you'll see all of these have really good dividend growth records. AT&T is the lowest at 4%. And this may end up being a falling angel because the company's going through some divestitures and that may change their dividend record um, over time. So we'll see if they stay on the list for 2022 at least. But, you know, AT&T has only increased their dividend by 4%. People's United, which is a regional bank, has grown their dividend by 5%. But these other companies have increased their dividends by very high rates. Now, AbV has you know, an extraordinary looking record, but it's a little bit misleading as is Nucor, which is a steel company. These are cheapest, but not necessarily, Nucor is not necessarily my favorite. And I'll get into why I say that here when I get it deeper into the video. But the point is they all meet my earnings yield criteria or close to it. As far as dividend yields, if I go over here and look at my dividend yields, I've got Nucor at only one and a half percent all the way up to AT&T at 7.6%. Then you've got a lot of stocks in here at 3 and 4%. Now, one thing I was asked if I, you know, could give me a list of stocks. One subscriber said that, you know, our dividend aristocrats are high quality dividend growth stocks yielding at least 3%. Well, several of them on this group would foot that bill. 
Okay, but there are some companies here that clearly have had issues or are having issues. You know, Walgreens Boots Alliance, along with CVS and other companies, got caught up in the opioid crisis. You have IBM, which is a company in transition. Franklin Resources have had some earnings issues here in recent years, but they've generated good cash flows and maintained their dividends. Archer Daniel Midland is a very cyclical company. Aflac is a life and health insurer that's a financial that, since coming out of the Great Recession, has been selling at a discounted P.E. So, you know, there are potentially reasons that could be very easily seen as I go through these for why all of these companies, you know, are trading at low valuations. Now, the next list of companies I created, I went and created what I consider to be the best dividend aristocrats. These are the companies that I like the best. I've got 25 of them here in the list. If I could wave a magic wand and get any of these companies trading at attractive valuations where I could get at least my 7.5% earnings yield or higher, in other words, I consider them fairly valued, these would be the ones I'd prefer to own. But unfortunately, I'm not able to find any of those. And, and let me illustrate that. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to add earnings yield to this graph here. Okay, so now I've added earnings yield. And just to give you a sense of, of the valuation conundrum I'm in, the lowest is realty income, which isn't really fair because that's a REIT. Now, I'll explain that. I would use cash flow yield there. But you got names like Echo Lives with only a 2%, S&P Global, a 2.8% yield. Next there are energy, my favorite utility stock on the planet at only a 2.91% earnings yield. Now, I do get a couple. Stanley Black & Decker gets close. General Dynamics is close. Johnson & Johnson and even Atmos Energy are getting to where there could be some opportunities to add them to my you know undervalued list here in the very, very near future. But for now, these stocks tend to be very, very overvalued. So let's go ahead and get into this list here, and let's look at, first of all, I'm going to look at my top 25 favorite. Now, I have a, an inside joke with a FastGraph subscriber who goes by the name of Ken. You know, Ken, I apologize. I'm going to use the new version of FastGraphs. We're getting really close to having this launched, but the reason I'm going to use it here is because I'm going to go through a list here very quickly, and I'm going to focus only on earnings here as the earnings metric on this first list here. But what I really want you to see is this. I want you to note that, you know, these companies have very similar, not perfectly identical, but very similar records of increasing their earnings very consistently and doing it at reasonably high rates. In the case of S&P Global at almost 12, just under 12 percent. The problem is when I put price on the graph, you can see that in normal times, I could buy this at a reasonable valuation where the price was you know, somewhere close to alignment with the orange line. Or even if I had a normal PE, which kind of puts a premium valuation on the stock, this would be the average market value. I still had plenty of times I could have bought it cheap. But if I look in recent years here, you can see that the stock has become very, very extended. That stock is significantly overvalued. And that's why the earnings yield is less than 3% right now, which is virtually half of what I would like. So I want you to get that perspective as I go through these very quickly. The first perspective, I want you to note the consistency of the earnings growth. Of course, the white line on the graph is the consistent dividend increase. That is, you know, an attribute of the fact that they're dividend aristocrats. But then focus on the fact that the price is so disconnected from the intrinsic value or even the market value line as I go through these. And I'm not going to do them in any particular order here. Just going to go through them very quickly. Here's Atmos Energy. You can see very consistent earnings growth, only at about 6.5%, but a really nice dividend record. And note that this one is starting to correct. In other words, this one's getting close to where it might be in fair value territory, and it's therefore one that I'd be watching very, very closely. You're going to see that with some other examples coming up here. The next would be McCormick. Now, McCormick had a big correction during COVID. You know, this is obviously the spice company. Everyone knows them by, I think, their McCormick spice packages, but it's packaged foods and meats. You know, very consistent earnings growth, almost, you know, just over 8.5% a year. Very good, you know, dividend record as well. The company is, you know, really exactly the kind of company that I'm looking to invest in. The problem, again, is overvaluation. 
Sherwin-Williams, premier paint company on the planet, very, very consistent earnings growth. These are the kinds of companies that I prefer to invest in the most. Now, admittedly, I could have you know, called this way overvalued back here and would have made a great deal of money if I invested in it, all right, over 20% a year. And I don't deny that and I don't argue with that, but I do feel like you're taking a great deal of risk here buying these stocks at high valuations. And you do hit periods of time when you do that, by the way, where your courage gets tested, if you will. You know, there's a period of time here from January of 2015 to, you know, the first week of December of 2016, where you had, you know, a period here that's spanning, it's getting close to spanning two years where you'd have made no money owning Sherwin-Williams, which was strictly a function of overvaluation. Going on, air products and chemicals, industrial gases, moderate cyclicality, but generally a very consistent grower, very consistent dividend record. And, you know, the market does like to put a premium valuation on this stock, I want you to note, but it's gotten, you know, ridiculous to the sublime here in recent years. Love this company, A-rated, you know, great stock, only 34% debt to capital, but significantly overvalued. Stanley Black & Decker is one that I did pick up when it got undervalued back here. I've had a couple of opportunities in recent years. You can see the correlation, a little bit cyclical, but yet very consistent growth at just under 8% a year. The stock has gotten overvalued, is beginning to correct. This one is getting close to becoming on you know, the best you know, valued list. If I get a little more you know, downside on Stanley Black & Decker. ADP, the market perennially prices this stock at a premium. Consequently, I've really never owned the stock. I, I did have some shares when it got really inexpensive back here coming out of the Great Recession. Again, very consistent growth, eight and a half, almost 8.6%. Very, very pricey. This is the problem that I'm running into. I'm going to start going quicker now. Beckton Dixon, again, you can see very consistent growth, good consistent dividend record, pricey stock right now, earnings yield of, you know, 5%. It's not crazy, but it's overvalued. Now, General Dynamics, I was recently buying this stock just as little as six months ago. You can see it got overvalued and corrected. It's now moderately overvalued again, but it's close. If I got a little break on General Dynamics, I could be adding it again. And by the way, I've been replacing that with Lockheed Martin, which is an aristocrat. Expeditors International, another very consistent grower, a little bit of cyclicality along the way. But notice the market always puts a premium valuation on this stock. And it's, you know, up there right now with an earnings yield of about 4.7%. Would love to own this one as well, but I need to buy it at a better valuation. Medtronic is a story I've told many, many times about, you know, how valuation can be crazy and how it can last a long time. Look how overvalued Medtronic was between these last two recessions we've had. Then it got inexpensive, and then you had several years where you could have acquired it. And then in recent times, it's become overvalued again. Struggled a little bit during COVID as a medical, you know, healthcare equipment, medical supplies company. Great dividend record. Again, the stock is simply too expensive to make sense. Johnson & Johnson, one of my largest holdings. I still own it. I'm not selling it. It's just a little bit out of my buy range now. But, you know, when you get price off the equation, this is clearly 8.5%, very consistent growth year after year after year and a super, you know, long-term dividend record as well. Here you have Lindy PLC, industrial gases. You know, the company does tend to trade at a premium, but again, the premium has gone completely out of sight here. Very consistent grower. These are the kinds of companies that I love to invest in when the market gives me the opportunity. Pepsi, big brand. You know, the brand identity gives it a premium valuation most of the time. Although when you did get a period, there was a time to be able to buy this stock coming out of the Great Recession. It's simply overvalued now. It grows over a little over 7% a year. Illinois Toolworks, one of my favorite companies in the world, 8% growth. A little bit of quasi-cyclicality. Great dividend records, significantly overvalued today. 3M, 3M is, you know, one of the impeccable quality companies, A-plus rated. I did have opportunities to buy it for four or five years here. I recently got an opportunity to add, which I did, you know, back in um, the beginning of actually, you know, April, May, June of 2020, even January, February of 2020. It's now become overvalued again, but, you know, not crazy if you're willing to buy it at its normal premium valuation, but I would like to get 3M cheaper as well. Echo Labs, the market chronically 
prices of stock at a premium. Up until the COVID, it, it had an impeccable record. Again, significantly overvalued here and, you know, for no real reason. Target, Target's, you know, really did well during the COVID. It's, you know, I hate to say that, but it did. The stock price reacted, but we're starting to see a little bit of chink in the armor here with Target. But this is the kind of company I want to own when the market gives me the opportunity to do that. Lowe's, you know, Lowe's is actually interesting. Uh, I may be being a little bit too severe with Lowe's. If, you, if you're willing to, you know, buy it at a P equals growth rate, it's actually not necessarily that expensive over the last eight or 10 years. This is one I could have missed. It's forecast to grow at 15% a year going forward. So, you know, but Lowe's is one that I did overlook, but here's one that you could invest in given the quality of the company as well as the, the historical growth rate. McDonald's, you know, is just significantly overvalued in my opinion. You know, this stock defies gravity in some cases, but, you know, normally you could buy this stock at a reasonable valuation, but with the, at these last six or seven years of crazy market values, McDonald's is significantly overpriced. W.W. Granger, love this company, would love to own it, love to be buying it at a more reasonable price. But unfortunately, Mr. Market has valued it real high. But we're starting to see, you know, potential. Now, we did get an opportunity to buy it during COVID. We also had an opportunity when some bad earnings came out in 17 and 18. So occasionally this one comes back to you. When it does, I think it's one that investors should consider adding to their portfolios. Hormel has historically been a you know, attractively valued, very high quality dividend, you know, aristocrat and dividend grower. The price has gotten really crazy and you can see the stock hasn't really done much in the last year. I would attribute that mostly to high valuation. Roper Industries, another one that I really, really like, very consistent growth, over 14% a year. You do have to buy this at a premium historically, but again, it's well above what the premium would normally be. My favorite utility stock, Next Era Energy, the old Florida Power and Light. You know, years and years you could buy this stock at a reasonable price, and now it's gotten just really crazy overvalued with the market exuberance that we're facing here lately. Realty income. Now, I mentioned this to you when I was looking at the portfolio. Here you want to go to FFO, probably the best REIT maybe in the world. It's not the fastest growing. It does have a great dividend streak. But you've got to buy this stock when it's reasonably priced if you expect to make any money other than just, you know, collecting the dividend. So that's one that I think you ought to be, you know, looking at. So so that's the 25, you know, perhaps best of the dividend aristocrats, okay, that are out there, but they're not necessarily the best value. So the top 10 dividend aristocrats based on valuation that I would look at would be these 10 coming up here right now. And that's this group here of dividend aristocrats that all have earnings yield over 7 or 8%. Now, again, there's always reasons. You know, you have to take that in consideration. Walgreens has had some issues, as I pointed out. The stock got very, very inexpensive, but I still consider it very, very attractively valued today. IBM is a company in transition. They're moving into the cloud. It's starting to bear fruit. The stock has been acting pretty good for the last year and a half or so, but the dividend has been impeccable. They've continued to increase their dividend year after year after year, and IBM looks like a very attractive purchase here for the, if you're willing to be a long-term investor. AbV is the spinoff from Abbott Labs. It's kind of a little silly to call it a dividend aristocrat in a way, but it is because it does you know, attach back to the Abbott Labs, but it's very, very inexpensive with a good yield, earnings yield of over 11%. Dividend yield almost 5%, four and three quarters percent. People's United is a kind of a, you know, slow growing regional bank, if you will. The dividend growth rate of this company is not necessarily very exciting. For the last decade or so, it's only increased the dividend by about, you know, one or two percent a year, 1.48 percent, you know, to be more precise. But it is reasonably priced. It does have somewhat of a margin of safety does offer a 4.5% yield. This would be one that you might want to look at if for no other reason than, than you know, the current dividend yield, if you will. Franklin Resources has gone through some issues, as I mentioned earlier. The stock really bottomed out during COVID. It's been recovering and it's expected to grow at a pretty decent rate going forward. So I think Franklin is a dividend aristocrat that is very reasonably priced today. This is one that's a crazy dividend aristocrat. And it's one that I really struggle with to be honest with you, because it's 
very cyclical like most steel companies are. There's really not been a lot of growth. If I look at the dividend growth rate, it's been less than 1% on most years. Now, there was a time back here where they did issue a special dividend a couple years. So this, where it looks like the dividend drop is inaccurate. It was the regular dividend was increased every year for 25 years. They've had this huge urge in earnings growth. I'm not sure why, but the bottom line is I think a lot of it has to do with maybe some of the you know, the COVID issues that are going on. But but regardless, it's A minus rated. It's a good quality company, but this is not my cup of tea. But it is reasonably valued with a very low dividend yield and a very low dividend growth rate. But technically, it had to be put on the list. And then, of course, American Telephone that has the issues of the spinoff. You know, they're going to split up the company. There's technically going to be a dividend cut, but not going to be very similar to what you saw with Abbott and AbV. You know, whether they'll maintain their status or not, if Standard Poor's will give them credit for, you know, maintaining their dividend when you take the two pieces and add them together. Well, that'll be the same. Aflac has been just significantly undervalued, in my opinion, for the, you know, Really, since coming out of the Great Recession, the market has been, been applying about a 10 PE. It's still doing that now, but it's got a nice earnings yield, a decent dividend yield, a great long-term dividend record. I think Aflac makes a lot of sense for long-term investing. Cardinal Health's dividend growth rate has slowed down quite a bit in recent years. Again, this is an opioids issue company. It's very, very undervalued. It actually is a pretty good company all around. It's got you know almost 7% growth. You can see valuation has always been a factor as to whether or not you could make any money owning this stock. And I, and I do think it's extremely undervalued today. Archer Daniel Midland is very cyclical. One thing I want to point out here, this looks like there's a bump in the dividend here. It's a misnomer because what you're really looking at is 18 months of dividend because the company went from a June fiscal year to a calendar fiscal year back in 2011 and 12. But otherwise, they're a dividend aristocrat. They track earnings very nicely. We've had a good surge in earnings growth. Going to flatten out a little bit, but a, you know, earnings yield 7.25%. I'd like to see that a little higher. Dividend yield about 2.4%. But this one at least is in the realm of reason. Anyway, these are my dividend aristocrats. The top 25 would be the ones that I would love to own if I could. The 10 that you know are available today are not necessarily you know, the best dividend aristocrats out there, but they do have good, they do have the dividend record to classify as an aristocrat. And, you know, I'd let you use your own judgments as whether or not they're the type of stocks you'd like to invest in. But, you know, the point is, just like the old Dragnet TV series years and years ago, some of you may be too young to remember it, but, you know, Joe Friday always said, just the facts, ma'am, just give me the facts when he was inter interrogating witnesses and I'm doing that's all I'm doing here guys is presenting the facts hope you enjoyed the video you've got my top 10 from a standpoint of valuation but you also have my top 25 from a standpoint of what I would really like to own if the market would give me a chance to buy them but I got a couple as I pointed out coming into decent range anyway thanks for watching once again give me a like ring the bell subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and uh, share this with your friends if you haven't already um, you know, we're here trying to help you be better, more informed investors, and we appreciate all of you. Thanks for watching.